This week is Parshas Tisavo, and it contains perhaps the most difficult portion in the Torah to read, the Tochacha, the admonition. And the way this is structured is that it's a series of if-then statements. If you do good and obey the Almighty, He will do good to you in return. But if you disobey God and you violate His commandments, then He will unleash all manner of suffering upon you. Now, it's important to note that this is not the first time that we've had this kind of Torah section. We had a milder version of it in Parshas Bichukos, in the end of the book of Leviticus. Now, it's not mild at all, but relative to what we have in our Parsha, it is mild because our Parsha really takes the cake. It's very hard to read. It's even harder to process and understand. The Torah describes in, in graphic in gory detail, all the terrible things that are going to befall us in the event that we repudiate God, we repudiate Torah, we forget about our sacred responsibility, and we follow the ways of the idolaters, and we sin, and we lose what is special about us, all terrible things are going to befall us. Now in Shul, when they read it on Shabbos, this whole section is bunched together into one of the alios of the Torah readings, and it's read in an undertone, and they read it really quickly, and it's really long because there's so many maledictions in this section. And actually, the tradition is to give this particular aliyah to the Balkor, to the person who's reading from the Torah, because you don't want to give someone the honor of having this Ali, of having this Torah session, because it's not much of an honor, because it's really sad and painful to read. And it's so long, and it goes on and on. And this week, when I was doing the Shnai Mikra, there is a tradition, there's a law, that you're supposed to read the Parsha twice, once with the translation. And I'm going through this particular Ali, or this particular section, and it's another page, and another page. And our sages calculate that there are 98 different curses and maledictions that the Torah prophesized will befall to those who disobey God and to the nation when the nation forgets its mandate. Now, I think if you have a familiarity with Jewish history, you know that many of these terrible curses actually did befall our people at various junctures of our history. And as an aside, I assume that most of y'all know this, but in case you don't, I have another podcast called The Jewish History Podcast. Give it a listen if you want to gain a greater appreciation and understanding of the wondrous story of our people. So this admonition, this tochacha, this reprimandation, these curses take up the bulk of our parsha. It starts off with the good. If you do good, if you obey the Almighty, you will get good treatment from him. But if not it will be catastrophic. And I think it's an interesting point to ponder. There is a gross asymmetry between the promises of reward, the good, if you do good, you will get good, and the 98 bone-chilling curses if you do bad. You you start from chapter 28, And it starts off very pleasantly. If you listen to God and you observe all his mitzvos, the Almighty will make you ascendant above all the nations and you'll have all these blessings and they will come after you, the blessings, and you'll be blessed in the city and you'll be blessed in the field and your children and your livestock and your produce will yield bountifully and you'll be able to defeat your enemies and you'll have stability and you have peace and security. A lot of really good things. But then after 14 verses, it turns very dark and very brutal, and it continues for dozens upon dozens of verses. The bad prophecies are much longer than the good prophecies and much more intense as well. I think it raises an interesting question. We have a principle that God's goodness outweighs his punishment by a factor of 500. Yet here, the focus is on the curses. The curses for disobedience and not the blessings for compliance. That is given almost like a token mention relative to the curses. The blessings are very short and very tepid. The question is why? Why are the curses so explicit and so terrifying and so comprehensive 
While the good side, the reward, and the blessing for good behavior, we have it. A few verses. It's nice. It describes a very pleasant world, but it's not as intense, and it's not as long, and it's not as comprehensive as the curses. Now, I want to ask a second question, a related question. These blessings and curses are situated in the parsha, following the instruction of what we must do, what must happen on day one of the crossing. So, of course, Moshe is about to pass. Joshua will replace Moshe as the leader, and they are going to finally cross over the Jordan and enter the land of Canaan. And on day one, we're told there's a lot of things that they need to do. Specifically, they have to do the covenant at Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And this is on the day of the crossing. They have to erect multiple stone monuments, one in the Jordan and one at Mount Ebal and one at Gilgal, Rashi tells us. And they go to these mountains, Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim, and they split up the nation. And half of the tribes go on to Mount Gerizim, the mountain of blessing. And half of the tribes go on to Mount Ebal, the mountain of curses. And the Levites and the Kohanim and the Ark are in the middle. And then they dispense these 11 blessings and curses. And they turn to one mountain, the mountain of blessing. And they give a blessing for the people who do good. And everyone answers, Amen. And then they turn to the other mountain, Mount Ebal, the mountain of curses, and they do the exact same thing that they just gave a blessing for. They inverse it, and they curse someone who doesn't do that. Or in the event that it is a negative thing, they curse someone who does do that. And this ceremony has to all happen on the day of the crossing. The Talmud actually notes that it was a great miracle to move an entire nation. It was a great distance. All in one day, it was a great miracle. But that is described in our parsha and implemented in the book of Joshua. But what else happened that day? So if you read the description of the verse, the verse tells us that it was also a day of a major feast. You get to Mount Ebal and you build an altar and you bring sacrifices and you bring peace offerings and everyone eats and you eat there and you're joyous before Hashem your God. So on this day where we have the nation split into two and the fearsome blessings and curses being dispensed and everyone saying amen to both the blessings and the curses, it's also a day of a celebratory pilgrimage that included festivities and eating and sacrifices and being joyous. But if you read it carefully, you notice something really interesting. Where exactly would you imagine that the altar is built and the celebration, the festivities, and everyone's eating together. Where did that happen? So we have two mountains. We have one mountain for blessing, Mount Reason. And nearby, we have a second mountain, Mount Ebal, the mountain for curses. Where would you imagine that the altar and the celebration and the festivities happened? So you read the verse. The verse says, this is verse 4 of chapter 27. It shall be that when you cross the Jordan, you should erect these stones, of which I command you today, on Mount Ebal, coat them with plaster, gives the whole description, and then we read a little bit later, you slaughter peace offerings and eat them, you should be rejoice, be joyous before Hashem your God. Wait a minute. We have one mountain for blessings. Mount Gerizim. And that's not where the festivities happen! The verse says explicitly that the festivities occur specifically on Mount Ebal. And the question is why? Why are the celebration festivities occurring on the mountain upon which the curses are conveyed? So we have two questions. Why are the curses, the 98 curses and maledictions, so much more pronounced and virulent relative to the blessings? Question number one. Question number two Why is the celebration on that day, the day of the crossing, why it's done on Mount Ebal, the mountain of curses? So I want to suggest an approach to these questions. We're going to try to answer these questions. And besides for answering the questions, I think we're going to develop a model 
for unlocking the greatness that we all have within ourselves. But what I'm going to tell you is not necessarily going to make you happy. That's the design. We're going to try to make you better, make us better, but maybe be a little bit uncomfortable. Let's begin. The Torah is our guide for living the best kind of life that we can live. It's here for our benefit. It's here for our betterment. And therefore, whatever we find in the Torah is all there to help us, to help improve ourselves, to help us achieve our purpose. Our sages tell us that when God rewards us for our good, that is for our benefit. And when God punishes us for our misdeeds, that too is for our good. The blessings and the curses are both for our benefit and betterment. But the benefit of these two experiences are very different. So here we go. We have a blessing. A blessing is focusing on what someone already accomplished. They did good. They obeyed God. They adhered to the covenant. Well, they deserve a blessing. It's a kudos. It's a reward for good past behavior. And then we have a curse. What's the point of the curse? So we would think that the curse is also about the past. It's punishment. The body's going to beat us up for our previous misdeeds and missteps. But our Satanists tell us something interesting. No, it is not about the past per se. It is much more about the future. It is a call to action. When the Almighty is punishing us for our misdeeds and missteps, He is trying to get us to rectify our ways. The curses are forward-looking to focus on what we still need to do. When the Torah spends so much more time, and so much more focus on the curses, that is revealing to us that harping on what we have yet to accomplish and we need to accomplish in the future, that is much more beneficial than to bask in the glory and ecstasy of past accomplishments. Moreover, the harshness of the disappointment and the disapproval that we undergo thanks to our flaws and the areas in which we need improvement, when we get that experience, when we get the curses, that's going to spur us to become bigger and greater people much more than when we get blessed, when we are lauded and praised for our successes. Think about it. Why are we here? What are we living for? Of course, we know the answer. We are here to do the will of the Almighty. We are here to perfect ourselves. We are here to make sure that our soul is prepared for the afterlife, for its eternal living. We are here to accomplish what the Almighty sent us here to do. We are here to become great. Which of these sentiments is going to help us get there? Is it thinking about our past successes, our blessings, or our future challenges? our quote-unquote curses. If you think about your previous successes and you ruminate upon it and you celebrate it and you really dwell in yesterday's triumphs, that carries the risk of getting complacent, of resting on your laurels, getting the feeling, you know what? I've done enough. I'm not a total disaster. I'm one of the good ones. After all, look at all those great accomplishments that we did yesterday. In the eyes of the Torah, that's not good. That's not good enough. We must max out our time here. And consequently, to be rebuked and admonished regarding our flaws and all the areas that you still need to improve in, and getting the feeling that there's still a lot more for me to do, that's a very valuable experience because that's going to help propel a person to actualize their potential. The Torah does not coddle us. The Torah doesn't give us participation trophies. The Torah is very exceedingly, inordinately, uncompromisingly demanding of us. Uh, You want to speculate. 
that there was never a truly great and transformative person who was coddled or pampered. By definition, when someone is told that they're so good and they're so wonderful and their accomplishments are so incredible, that is a signal that they've done enough. And necessarily, it makes them complacent to one degree or another. If you want to become truly transformationally great, you have to be a little maniacally focused on improving all the time. That means minimal celebration of successes and maniacal, Belichick-esque, Kobe-esque determination to always be improving. Now, for our sizable international audience who doesn't get those above references, replace it with, I don't know, a Pele-esque or Ronaldo-esque determination. That is what the Torah wants of us. Not to be average, not even to be good. To literally be the best that you could be. To maximize every opportunity that you have. To actualize all of your potential. To squeeze every ounce of greatness out of you. And this is not done by coddling. This is done by how the Torah does it. Back to the blessings and curses. If you do good, you get a blessing. And that's short and it's really pleasant. But it's not scintillating in any way. And then you read the curses. And it's really harsh. And it's really over the top. The Torah is telling us that we do indeed need to acknowledge and celebrate our successes. You have to have the blessing. But the celebration of successes is much smaller than focusing on what we still need to do. I think that people severely underestimate their abilities. People at large, most of us suffice with doing the minimal amount of work to not get fired and to not feel bad about yourself. That's the default state of humanity. The Torah tells us that we're made out of dust. Dust is sedentary. Unless there is great effort to move it, it's going to remain inert. That's what humans are. We're going to do the minimal. That is how we are predisposed. But there's a possibility or there is an engine, there's a fire within us that if it is unleashed, mountains can be moved. I think this is kind of how startups eventually defeat and unseat incumbents. You know, how how does a small company with limited resources and limited Revenue. How do they upend the established player with huge budgets and massive revenue? How does that happen? I think this is the answer. If you have someone squeezing the maximum out of themselves, working nights and 18 hours a day and being totally immersed in the product and thinking about the problems 24-7, that one person could potentially be more powerful than 10 people, than even 100 people doing just enough to not get fired. You know, over the summer, I read a biography on Elon Musk. I gather there's a new one in the works. I read the old one. It's kind of an amazing thing. You know, how does a startup with a shoe stringed budget perpetually on the brink of insolvency, has become the most valuable car maker in the world? This is a very bold initiative to build the first American car company since, I think, Chrysler in the 1920s. Oh, and on the side, also building a rocket company to colonize Mars. It's a crazy thing. It's just insane how ambitious the goals are. So it was a really interesting book. And there was one citation that particularly intrigued me. So I took a picture of it. It's talking about how he would get the employees to do the impossible on top of the impossible. So this is a quote. One former SpaceX executive described the working atmosphere as a perpetual motion machine that runs on a weird mix of dissatisfaction and eternal hope. Quote, it's like he has everyone working on this car that's meant to get from Los Angeles to New York on one tank of gas, this executive said. They will work on the car for a year and test all of its parts. Then, when they set off for New York after that year, all the vice presidents think privately 
that the car will be lucky to get to Las Vegas. But what ends up happening is the car gets to New Mexico twice as far as everyone expected. And Elon is still mad. He gets twice as much as anyone else out of people. This is what the Torah is doing to us. It's displaying displeasure, disappointment, criticism, not being satisfied with anything besides for absolute perfection. And this is the way to get 100% out of people. The Torah wants 100% out of us. And the asymmetry of the blessings and curses are designed to do precisely that. I want to add another wrinkle to this. I think it's not just that it's okay to celebrate successes. I think that the way the Torah has it designed, that you have you know 14 verses of blessings for your successes, and then it launches into all the areas that you need to improve, I think that is necessary. It has to be like that. The first step is where a person has to recognize that they are a superpower. Most people are just totally unaware of what they are actually capable of. Most people have never actually pushed themselves to the farthest that they could go Most people, I think, have never taken themselves to the extreme. Most people have never thought so hard that their head literally hurt. Most people are just totally ignorant to the superpower balancing precariously on their shoulders. But I'm not talking to most people. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to the friends of the Parsha podcast. You're different than most people. There was a time in your life when you were surprised at what you were able to accomplish. That moment, that is the first realization that you were created. You are destined for great things. You were surprised because you didn't know that you had it in you. And that first eureka moment, that is a snapshot that is actually 1% of what you are truly capable of. But that's the necessary first step. The first step is to have a little bit of blessing, a little bit of recognition that you have the potential that is so vast and so enormous and so world-changing, but it's all raw. And it needs to be unearthed and cultivated and developed. But there is a grave danger of subsisting with that tiny little peak into your greatness. If you dwell too long on that blessing, you get a feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction, and that can imperil the entirety of the potential from surfacing. So after that relatively brief blessing, our attention is turned to the curses, to what is still left to get done. And the delta, actually, no, we shouldn't use that word. Today, that's a weighty word. We'll use a different word. Not and the delta. And the gulf between your first peak into your greatness and what you can actually become is vast. And that is what the Torah, the guide to become extraordinary, not just good, that is what the Torah focuses on primarily. I think that as someone who had the great fortune of spending time in yeshiva, this was a format that now looking back in hindsight – I could see that this was actually a pedagogical technique used in some of the yeshivas that I was in. So, for example, in one yeshiva that I was fortunate enough to attend, they would have chakras, morning prayers in the yeshiva, and it was pretty early. And the boys would leave the base medrash, the study hall, at, at midnight. And then chakras is like seven hours later, seven o'clock. So it would happen that the students would oversleep. And the dean of the yeshiva, every morning, would walk up and down amongst the students studying in the study hall, and he would give a very cold disposition towards the people who missed shachras, towards the people who overslept. If you made it great, he would give you a warm smile, but you kind of dreaded that chilly, cold stare, and it made you want to work really hard to make sure that you were up in time. And this is all calculated. If you show displeasure, 
that prompts the person to improve themselves. Another thought that I had, listen to this. In the yeshiva, there is this concept called saying over or writing a chabur. What does this mean? It means that the yeshiva collectively is studying a book of Talmud and we're studying it with great intensity and and depth, trying to plumb the depths of the Talmud. And every day you would study and you would hear a lecture and you would review the lecture and you'd argue and debate with your chavru, so we study partner and with the lecture, etc. But periodically, they would have the students themselves develop a discourse or a treatise on a given subject of Talmud study. And that means that you have to basically say your own lecture. And you're a kid, you're a teenager. What do you know about giving Talmudic lectures? Well, the yeshiva and this is commonplace in many yeshivos, they would try to spur the boys, spur the students to challenge themselves and it would force them to work really, really hard. It often means maybe staying up an entire night, studying Torah, preparing, analyzing, really honing and sharpening your discourse, your lecture, your they're going to give. This is designed to nudge you to do something that you did not know you were capable of. Now, like many yeshivos, on Simchas Torah, there is a custom to sell the honors of Simchas Torah, the opening the ark and saying the blessings, etc. And they would sell the honors not for money, but for Torah accomplishments. So, for example, the great Mir Yeshiva that I had the great fortune of attending, they would sell the greatest honor for pages of Talmud. So you would bid, so to speak, how many pages of Talmud you're willing to study to earn the right to get this honor over the next year. I remember there was someone who bought the most distinguished honor for 3,100 pages of Talmud. Now, if you've never studied Talmud, that sounds like, okay, well, 3,100 pages, I don't know, that's the Lord of the Rings or something like that, doable over a year. But that's because you've never studied Talmud, you don't know what it's like. To study one page of Talmud is very, very difficult. It's not like reading a page from a novel. It's intricate and it's back and forth and the concepts are all addressed, you know, in a very pithy fashion and it's very difficult. It's difficult to study a page of Talmud. And to study 3,100 of them is something that most people don't do in a lifetime, much less in a year. Moreover, there are only 2,711 pages in the whole Talmud. And this person bid 3,100 pages of Talmud over the next year, and he did it. He would study the whole Talmud, the whole Babylonian Talmud, Jerusalem Talmud. He would do it multiple times a year. And this was a student in the yeshiva. I actually would study with him, and we had a study session in the yeshiva. And when was it? It was from 1 to 2 a.m., on Friday morning. So late, late, late Thursday nights, we get together, we'd study. That's this just, just a different level of diligence and tenacity in study. But there was one yeshiva that I was in that they would sell the honors for Simchas Torah. They would sell it not for pages of Talmud, but for discourses, for treatises to be delivered over the course of that year. And I remember there was one guy in the yeshiva who bid 43 chaburs. He said, I'm going to deliver 43 lectures, 43 novel lectures on Talmud, novel discourses on Talmud over the course of the year. And this struck me, this happened many years ago, but it struck me that what this guy is in effect undertaking is, hey, we've all given one, right? We've all done one. And if you could do one, and that takes you a week to do, What happens if you do another one the next week? And maybe a third one the third week. And 43 weeks out of the year. So every week, you do another one. If you could do one, why can't you do 43? But what happens when someone forces themselves to do 43 Talmudic lectures as a young yeshiva student over the course of a year? They're, in effect, challenging themselves to become a great Torah scholar in one year. That's the idea here. The Torah is not trying to make our life easy. This is making our life hard, more difficult. It's trying to squeeze all that greatness that we have within us. Squeeze it out. Maximize our output. Maximize our greatness. 
And given that, that's the objective of Torah, it is better for us to not be coddled and reassured, oh, you're so good. The Torah focuses on all the things that we're not perfect in and all the things that we can accomplish in this effort to get the absolute maximum out of us. I want to end with one caveat. My grandfather of blessed memory, he used to always say that he spoke to the Chazonish, so the great leader of world Jewry, who passed away in 1953, and he said to him that you used to be able to be harsh and critical with students. But today, this is going back already 60, 70 years, today it's only possible to work with positivity. People today are much softer. They're much more fragile. And if we are too harsh on them, they're going to flee. So I think that the Torah's approach is probably not one that we should adopt with our children, with our charges, because it can have a backlash. The kids can rebel. But the Torah, I think, is viewing us as Navy SEALs. We're the best of the best. And we have all this limitless potential, but it's all raw. And it's all in need of development and cultivation. So what does it tell us? It tells us that our successes are amazing. And they're to be acknowledged and moderately celebrated. But that is not what we should focus on if the pursuit is about unlocking every ounce of our potential. To do that, we need a tenacious and dogged pursuit of all the things that we've hitherto not achieved. And those are the curses. And when there are two mountains, and one mountain signals our successes, yay! And the other one signals our shortcomings. And that is the mountain of challenges. We need to make a feast. That celebration is hosted on Mount Ebal because that criticism, harsh and biting and painful as it may be, as difficult to swallow and accept as it may be, that critique is what will propel us to be worthy of eternal celebration. Okay, let's get to this week's A and Q, answers and questions. We're going to ask a question, and you can submit an answer to me, RabbiWolby at gmail.com. So our project begins with the Bikurim ceremony. It's a very elaborate ceremony with an even more elaborate declaration. You take the first fruits and you put them in a basket and bring it to the Kohen in the temple. And then you have this very long declaration. And it starts off, Arami Oved Avi, the Aramean, wanted to destroy my father and they went down to Egypt and lived there. And it tells the whole story of the Exodus. And this is actually the backbone of the Haggadah. We go through the declaration of the first fruits of the Bikurim from the beginning of our Parsha. Now, a dear friend and study partner of mine named Al asked the following question. He says, who is this Aramean that wanted to destroy our forefathers? So Rashi tells us, well, this Aramean, the only Aramean that we know, is Laban. Laban wanted to destroy everything. Laban was way worse than Pharaoh because Laban pursued Jacob and he would have done terrible things had the Almighty not stopped him and not quelled and stamped out his plans. And therefore, we're thanking the Almighty that the Almighty has been with us and watching over us and watching over our nation all the way since the Aramean tried to destroy our nation, all the way since Laban tried to destroy Jacob and the nation in its infancy when Jacob was fleeing from Laban. But here's the question that my friend Al asked. Why is he called Aramean? Why not call him Laban? Laban's been called Laban the whole Torah. Of course, he really hasn't featured much since we left him, since we hightailed and absconded out of there in the beginning of, or in the middle, really, of the book of Genesis. But he's called Laban. And suddenly now, when we're talking about the declaration of the first fruits, the Bikurim, and what we have to say, we talk about the Aramean who want to destroy our father. Why not say simply Laban who tried to destroy our father? Isn't that a simpler term? Be direct. Laban tried to destroy Jacob. Why 
Does the Torah conceal almost the identity of this very first villain, the Aramean, who transformed our father? That's the question. If you have an answer, send me an email. Rabbi Walby at gmail.com. Okay, let's get to last week's question. Last week, we asked the question of why the Ben Sorer Umore, the wayward and rebellious son, why is he afforded the out that his parents can absolve him by not bringing him to court. Every other transgression, every other capital offense, if the parents say, we don't want to bring him to court, it doesn't matter. The witnesses bring him to court and the person is tried, the child is tried, provided that they are 13, they are an adult, they're no longer a minor, they can be tried. But here with the wayward and rebellious son, only if the parents bring him to court, only then is the child tried. And we even asked, we framed the question, wait a minute. The Torah says that the reason why he is executed is because of his future crimes. He's going to become a murderer and a thief. It's better to kill him innocent than to kill him guilty. So why, if we're doing him a favor, in effect, by killing him when he's innocent before he gets guilty, why does that all hinge on the parents signing off on it? So I heard an amazing and life-changing answer. The Torah tells us that this wayward and rebellious and gluttonous son will become a murderer. It's a done deal. If he has this particular constellation of behaviors now, at the formative adolescent years, eventually he will use up, deplete the money of his parents and he'll go to a crossroads and harass the populace and become a thief and a murderer. It's a done deal. Kill him before he gets guilty. But only if the parents agree. Meaning that this fact that the parents have to sign off, that's actually one of the conditions by which we know that his fate is sealed. If a child steals and buys meat and eats in a bad company, and his parents don't believe in him, and his parents give up on him, then he is destined to become a murderer. It's not just a clause in the judicial process. It is an inherent aspect of the central idea. Only if the parents are convinced that he cannot change, only if the parents give up on him, then it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. But what if the parents believe in the child? You know what? Even if he has all the other factors, he is not necessarily doomed no matter how dire the situation gets. The Ben Saramora, kill him now, because he will become a murderer. Unless his parents refuse. If the parents believe in the child, he won't become a murderer. It's only when the parents give up on a child that it is a fait accompli. The parents hold the keys to their children's fate. No one can influence a child like a parent can. A good parent always believes in their child. And when the child knows that, no matter how far they have fallen, no matter how dire the prognosis gets, they are never doomed. And therefore, they don't fit into the category of someone who we could say definitively that they should die innocent and not die guilty because you know what? Maybe they won't be guilty after all. Okay, thank you for listening. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I'm back in the Torch Center. Does the audio sound better? Does it sound better? Does the permeating humidity of Houston, Texas translate to the microphone? I don't know. You let me know, send me an email. And thank you for listening. Have an amazing and fabulous and splendid rest of your day. And a incomparable and delightful and joyous and harmonious and peaceful and joyous in every possible Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.